everybody, Adam Parks here with another episode of Receivables Roundtable. Today, I'm here with my new friend, Chris Helton, who is the Chief Technical Officer for Remitter, an organization focused on digital collections. How are you doing today, Chris? I'm doing great today, Adam. Great to, uh, great to be here with you. Great to be a first-time participant. I guess, what, first-time caller? Um, long-time listener? <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much. I'm glad that you're uh, joining us today. And and I want to talk a little bit about some really creative things here about deliverability and some of the challenges that we face when it comes to digital collections. Uh, But for anybody who's not familiar with you, could you tell everybody a little bit about yourself and how you got to the seat that you're in today? Sure. Sure. Um, So I, I was really kind of I guess, born and raised in this industry. Um, I started in the the BPO contact center receivable space uh, back in 1991. And I spent uh, 14, 15 years uh, with a single company, grew from 100 people to a global entity. We delivered software into the industry. Um, And it's really where I think I started to look at how to accomplish something a little bit differently. So how do you leverage technology to start solving problems instead of just being a tool that people are using to just offer some capability? Um, after that, I jumped over and I spent some time at uh, AT&T and I did some uh, work in their innovation factories. Um, so I spent five years doing innovation. I led innovation in the Midwest. Um, And then I thought it was time to get back into some more fun tech space. So um, I actually launched my own company about seven or so years ago, um, doing very much the same thing Remitter does, focused on this deliverability um, activity. We focused on our entity or on marketing content, not payment content, but still the end state was something the same, right? I needed a behavior of somebody to do something based on uh, email, SMS, MMS, some of those other activities. Um, And uh, ran that for seven years and I got introduced to the remitter team and I thought, oh, what an opportunity to get back to the roots uh, of BPO and contact centers and collections. I loved what the team was doing. I loved the conceptual ideas that they put together and the tool they had. Um, And so I was able to join that team and really now start to focus on Let's continue to evolve that. So let's bring some of that innovation from my background. Um, Let's bring some of the thought uh, leadership that they're driving in this. And let's create some really great tech that really focuses on, and let's stay on today's topic, right? That's focused on driving really the best deliverability that exists in the industry and, and really getting past that obstacle. Okay. So, you know, for anybody who's not familiar with Remitter and what you guys are doing over there, could you tell everybody a little bit about Remitter? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Remitter is, I love this term that the team has used, so I'm, I, I keep stealing it from our team, uh, frictionless payments. Um, and so, and it's really a, a digital opportunity for, it's really digital optimization of a, kind of a collection channel using the the ability to do what they call frictionless payments. And I I just love that term because so many of these industries, they try to accomplish that. So many in this space try to accomplish this activity with um, people and resources and just, you know, throwing more people and activity at it. Um, And it doesn't really look to how people want to engage today. Um, and so there's a new type of customer experience that has to evolve. And so digitizing what's happening in that space is there. So in a very simple nutshell, we really take kind of that information that's coming from the client. We create these very simple to use and engaging communications um, that are driven both in email and MMS and even some other channels that we're uh, continuing to dive into. Um, and we get that really set in front of a consumer at kind of a point in time. And then we're using AI and ML to really direct what that is. So that might be the type of content, how they engage in the content um, might predict 
what next piece of content that I want to send and what's going to be that? Is it going to drive a payment plan? Is it going to drive some other um, opportunity? Is it going to set thresholds on it, timeframes in it? Is there a better time of day to connect with them? Is there a better channel to connect with them? Which ones are going to drive opens and reads um, in a better activity to drive that engagement? Because at the end of the day, I mean, if people owe money, right, it's very easy to ignore the phone call. Um, so how do I engage with somebody a little bit differently nowadays? Um, and so now if I can get them on the, the channel that they're always on, I think there's an interesting t- statistic out there. I think our mobile device is within three feet of us 98% of the time. So <clears throat> if I can engage you on that, yeah, if I can engage you on that and get you to work with that, um, that is a great activity. And it, it, again, if it's the way the consumer wants to work, the voice channels always still exist. But if I can engage in a different way, which I might prefer to deal with, that's a better activity. So I think kind of in a nutshell, that's what we do. We just streamline that activity um, uh, for our customers. So meeting the consumer in the discussion space that they want to meet in, I think is yeah. you know a really powerful statement. And for the most part, you know, I, I viewed that as the the main objective of Reg F as that rolled out last year, and I know we're a little bit, you know, more than a year into that uh, right. into the deployment and, and the application of that law. Um, but I think that is the point, right? And it sounds like you guys are putting the tools and the technology together to enable that to happen, which is mm-hmm. very exciting. But with that comes unique challenges, right? It's it, it's. Um, it's a very noble effort, but it does take some some expertise and some engineering to actually execute on these things. And so one of the things that I've, I've seen as someone who has spent the last you know, 15 plus years building websites in the space, managing domains and email systems and technology platforms, building software and all of that, um, you know, when digital collections first started to enter our vernacular as an industry, I had quite a few different groups reach out to me and say, oh, you're going to help me send my emails. And I'd say, well, no, that's not at all what I'm going to do because do you realize that those organizations that are successful in digital collections are often having to deploy significant resources towards the deliverability and the management of deliverability. And what we mean by that is anybody can send an email, but is it getting through? Right. right. Is it getting through the spam filters? Is it getting through the um, provider level filters and the social filtering that has become a reality? The mm-hmm. same way that I know I use a, a spam filter on my phone to block 10 plus calls a day that are coming in from various spammers. Right. But I'm mm-hmm. using social blocking, meaning I'm tying into other people are blocking numbers and it's all going into a database and that's helping us to identify the, the risk level of any incoming call. And the same thing is happening when it comes to email, social media messaging, and text messaging. So can you talk to me a little bit about what deliverability is like at Remitter and how you guys are addressing some of the challenges that come along with being able to actually deliver these digital communications? Yep. Yeah. Um, and I, I think you're right. I mean, you've hit something on it, right? If, if on the, if the reason people are going to digital is that the spam filters on phones and everybody else, right? It's a spam caller blocked or whatever, and you never pick it up. Um, as that advances, as, as that advances over into the other spaces, you got to be very intelligent about what's going there. And it's a multi kind of pronged attack. Um, where we do that. So some of it is about technology and how we lay out the technology. And I'll go through a few of those. Some of that is is just about the art of, of doing some of this, right? So, you know, some of the things both from a regulation standpoint, as well as just a good, intelligent outreach activity. So don't use all caps, right? Spam filters are going to tag that um, very easily. Um don't have exceptionally long subject lines, right? This is the art side of it, right? Mm-hmm. Three to five um, words in a subject sure. line is kind of optimal from a, a deliverability standpoint. And you always have to be watching those. And we're always receiving that. So 
what we do is we obviously are gathering analytics on everything we send, every click, every activity, what pieces of the content are being engaged in. So this paragraph, that item, this button, um, we're always paying attention to all of those pieces and then using that intelligence to drive better content and ensure this deliverability. Um, you know, avoid, you know, some of these are just obvious, but avoid, you know, excessive use of exclamation points or Flash and JavaScript and embedded forms, right? Those items just don't do that in email. It's going to impact your deliverability. It's going to trigger the big uh, delivery, uh, mail delivery systems, you know, the Microsofts, the Googles, et cetera. It's going to trigger their, their spam filtering. Um, what we do internally is mm -hmm. to go look at it too, is to launch, you just can't start this, right? It's, it's, you just can't go launch. If I was today going to go, I'm going to go market to a million people or send out a million messages. I'm going to get triggered as spam because I've never sent a million messages yeah. before. And so that is a, just a gigantic trigger on the email side. Um, so we do a lot of things around kind of, mm -hmm. kind of carrier. So we do a, a, a few things around kind of sender authentication protocols, right? You want kind of a, a valued sender name. So we want to authenticate that. Um, we warm the IPs, right? So we build up the strength of that IP reputation in the platform, and that takes time, right? It's, it's filtering off some of the activity to come from a different IP so we can continually warm that. So we started at 5,000 and then 7 and 10 and et cetera, where we can get into doing a million and we're not seen as a spammer because our activity is driving uh, items. Um, and then I always bounce back to the good. We've got an entire team of, I think, folks are focusing on the content and driving good messages, right? That's a big thing. Um, we're, we're building the warm IPs. We're utilizing a delivery network, right? We don't remain on one item mm. um, to go uh, to, to be the single path. We want multiple IPs warmed, multiple IP, uh, IPs ready to be in our delivery framework so we can do that. That takes a lot of time. That takes a lot of coordination. That takes a lot of people um, to be able to balance that. I think a fun one too is on. It, it, you got to look at SMS as well in that delivery framework. So that's that was a whole. All of those rules, I think, pay attention. I can't warm an IP for SMS, um, but I can warm. I can warm a number, um, and that helps, right? So if I'm using a short code or a long code that's coming out, and I want to deliver from that, I can warm that number. Um, but also I avoid things like enormous mass drops in, in their items, right? I might distribute that across multiple um, outbound numbers from a delivery standpoint. Um, we may, uh, we'll call that like sender ID. So we use, and then a, a simple one might be don't use alphanumeric sender keys, right? Do send, you know, don't be ABC at one, two, three company. That is a horrible number that's going to be spam. up. Uh, regular numbers, uh, regular short codes are the ones that are, uh, uh, are really drive the most benefit. Um, and then uh, there's always the one, don't use the spam words, free, guaranteed, et cetera. <laughs> those are, those are going to fire you right off to the spam filter. Um, they're going to shoot you right down that path. So, mm. um, and then some simple ones, right? Have a valid sender name, have a valid recipient name. It's, you, you think that's not much work, but uh, I mean, to Mary is better than to anonymous and to guest. Um, you know, they're, the, the email sender networks are paying attention to those items. Um, and then I always, the, the funny ones always to me is spell it right. Right. There's a spell checker, like everywhere you go, uh, just spell it right. Right. You've, I've seen yeah. this, I've seen the scam ones come to me. And the sentences are incorrect and it's uh, poor mm. spelling. And I'm going, that's an immediate delete. And that one's always going to my spam filters or something else. Um, legitimate emails are typically mm. spelled properly. So. Typically. Yeah. Typically. <laughs> well, it sounds to me like you guys have, have, well, it sounds to me like you guys have started to find this balance between the art and the science of delivering yeah. digital communications for collections. And so when it comes to the 
it's called the scientific side. You're talking about the deliverability frameworks. You're talking about the ability to get those messages out there from a technical capacity, right? Getting past the spam filters and all that. And then on the flip side, you're looking at the art of these things. And although I'm sure the art and the science is somewhat blended here, but from an artistic standpoint, you're looking at the content and how that content is being interacted with and who's using which content and what's prompting responses and through what channels, which I, I find that to be interesting because coming together and where those lines start to blur somewhere in the center, right? Between the art and the science seems to be where you guys are finding most of your success. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's interesting on the balance of them because you, you look at the two, if I look at just the two channels, email and SMS and or, or, or MS, either one. Um, in, in, in email, I have a, I have an exceptional, like we're 99.9 .9 something successful in our delivery rates. Um, it, it is exceptional in delivery. Now, how is that engaged with, right? It's a little bit different than that. That has a lower engagement rate than SMS and MMS. People engage more in the mobile channel, um, but it's less deliverable. Um, cause if I receive a number and, and actually I, probably one of the things I touch on is uh, we do spend a lot of time, I think, validating, um, information. So again, if you give me, um, if you gave me junk emails mm -hmm. and, and I'm sending out junk emails, that's hampering my reputation from a delivery standpoint. I like to validate that information on the way in. So we do a lot of checking on emails. We do validations kind of if it's a mobile number, et cetera, right? So we want to do that because sending stuff to landlines and when I fire that out and I hit the carrier network and the carriers come back and go, I can't deliver that, right? You just tried to send a text to a landline. Mm -hmm. Those hamper my, th those, those track back to us. And so those are also pieces that we're balancing on the inside of it. So we want to balance kind of that. I think you're right. It's art in that. But it's interesting. I get so much more engagement, but less de deliverability on SMS. Um, I get great deliverability on email, but less engagement because people don't read it as much. It's, it's much easier to pick up my phone and read the text than the email. While it's delivered on both, they're probably both there on the same device. True. You're going to find that, you know, the consumer preference is probably, you know, I, if you send me an email, I'm going to get to it in the normal course of business, but text messages, I'm generally going to be responding considerably faster, but that's also why I have a tree of phone numbers, right? Yeah. You know, phone numbers coming to my primary line, I'm going to respond to much faster than those that I'm kind of doing the same thing that I do with email, right? Because if an email mm -hmm. is coming through and I don't know who it is, I don't want my phone sounding like a pinball machine all day. So I'm pushing things over to folders and I've got rules and filters and things in place to, yeah. to kind of manage that process as much as possible so I can maintain my focus on those most important things. Um, I don't know that most of your consumers are going to that level of email management, but they also may not be receiving a thousand emails a day that need to be filtered and gone right. through um, by various people on my team. So, you know, that's the the differentiator between kind of the business and the um, and the the general consumer. But it sounds like you guys have, have spent a lot of time looking at the science, looking at the art, and then saying, how do we blend these things together to find success in digital collections? That we have. And then I think the magic is kind of now we're using that artificial intelligence and that machine learning to say, how are those pieces engaging, right? We may have multiple ways to say, this is our mm -hmm. first contact to you, da, 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 da. But we want to look at which way did we say it performed the best? Um, and can we drive more activity sure. that and continue sure. to test? And it takes some sample size to figure that out, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> data, while it's called data science, it should be more called data art because it is, it is learning and training and educating the machine over and over again with iterations.
Well, Chris, I want to thank you again for coming on and having a chat with me today. I think digital collections is something that is at the forefront of the entire receivables management industry, but not sure that everybody from the C-suite down truly understands the challenges. And even the regulators, I've had many conversations where they just don't necessarily truly understand the level of difficulty to communicate with consumers through a variety of channels uh, you know, simultaneously. Um, even though that we've gotten the green light through Reg F to do certain things, it does also take some technical expertise, some technical infrastructure, and some artistic understanding to be able to truly execute on those things at the highest levels. But I appreciate you coming on, having a chat with me today, and helping me to educate the industry on what what really challenges uh, the industry is facing from a digital collection standpoint? Uh, hey, Adam, I appreciate the time. It was great to get to talk to you. And um, this is this is a fun topic um, to be able to go through. So uh, we love solving that issue and kind of evolving it day after day. So I appreciate all the time. Absolutely. For those of you that are watching, if you have additional questions you'd like to ask Chris or I, you can leave those in the comments on LinkedIn or YouTube. We'll be happy to respond to those. Or if you have additional topics that you'd like to see us cover, you can leave those in the comments below as well. And I'm sure Chris would be happy, I hope, would come back and chat with me some more and continue to update the industry on what digital collections things are working and how that whole side of the business works. But until next time, Chris, thank you so much for coming on and participating today. I look forward to meeting you in person at an upcoming conference in 2023. But thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate your time today. Excellent. Thank you, Adam. I appreciate the time. And thank you, everybody watching. We'll see you again soon.